So today I'm doing the first part of my January wrap up. All the books that I read during the first half of January. So I'll stick around to see what I've been up to. Well, hey friends, Roger here, and welcome to my channel, Roger's Reads. So today I'm doing part one of my January wrap up, and I've read uh, five books during the first half of January. I know it's already past the 15th, but I'm a little bit late as usual. So anyway, as I mentioned, I read five books in the first part of January. And the first book I read is entitled Something Worth Saving by Sandy Ward. So here we have a story about a boy and his cat. Now I've read quite a few books told from the dog's point of view, such as A Dog's Purpose and A Dog's Journey, but this is the first book that I've read that's told from the point of view of a cat. And how about that cover? The cover is just adorable. So something worth saving follows our two main characters, Charlie and the beloved adopted family cat, Lily, from whose point of view the story is told. Now Lily is worried because she's seen numerous bruises on Charles' body and uh, is determined to find out who is hurting her boy, the boy that adopted her in spite of her limp and that she was actually abused uh, before she ended up at the shelter. So now she's trying to get the other family members to focus on Charlie, but that's not an easy task considering the amount of complicated family drama that's unfolding at the moment. In fact, the family seems to be kind of unraveling. Uh, Charlie's mother kicked out Charlie's father a few weeks prior. And now there's a strange new man hanging around <laughs> Charlie's mom. Uh, Charlie's sister, Veronica, has a new, dodgy, somewhat mean-spirited boyfriend who seems to uh, openly dislike Charlie. And then there's Charlie's older brother who is bitter that his, uh, that his father no longer lives with him. And even Karen's father has begun acting strangely and in a, in a bizarre manner. So I really enjoyed reading this story from Lily's point of view and, and chuckled a time or two at her interesting and uh, not always spot on interpretation of the events around her and the, and the conversations around her. As Lily desperately tried to understand the humans in the house and their motivations. So, you know, I really thought this was such a clever approach to a story. And Lily's narration definitely added an extra fun element to the narration, and I enjoyed watching her trying to uh, make sense of the information that came her way. So, this ended up being a sweet, touching, bittersweet tale about an eavesdropping cat who does everything in her power to help Charlie. But though this story is light and humorous in places, it's poignant and has a, has a surprising amount of depth to it. In fact, it touches on several hard-hitting themes, such as alcoholism, and divorce, abuse, bullying, and intolerance. So though it's heartbreaking in places, it is ultimately a positive story of hope and survival. Now, I will say that the story did sometimes drag in places, uh, at times agonizingly so, and some of the narration was a tad clumsy and overly simplistic. I mean, we are being told the story from the voice, point of view of a cat, but you know, I think perhaps the author made the cat's voice a little too childlike, resulting in a stilted narration at times. But still, I ended up enjoying the story, and, uh, and I would definitely uh, read more by this author. And this was actually, I actually won this book in a Goodreads drawing, so a big thank you to Goodreads for that. So the next book that I read is entitled Howling on Hold by E.J. Russell. And this was an ARC actually that I received from NetGalley, so I don't have the physical copy, but I'll put the uh, cover up there or up there. So Howling on Hold is a fun, gay, shifter story that takes place at a group residence for werewolves uh, called The Howling, also called The Dog House. So young werewolves need to spend three years at the residence in order to help them to, to, to uh, control their instincts so that they're able to blend more seamlessly into the ordinary world. So the story follows two main characters, uh, Chase, who is the RA at the Howling residence, and Tanner, who is a young alpha in training who is nearly at the end of his uh, three-year stint, after which he must return to his pack and into his role of alpha. So given that Chase is the RA and in a position of responsibility, he has pretty much suppressed and ignored his feelings for Tanner. And likewise, Tanner has pushed aside his feelings for Chase. 
So now that Tanner is turning 21, he's hoping that perhaps things will be different now that he's officially an adult and no longer under Chase's charge. But Tanner's world comes crashing down on the eve of his 21st birthday, resulting in Tanner being missing and on the run for his life after Chase rebuffs him. And Chase being stripped of his uh, RA duties. So yeah, a lot of crap went down that night. So now the question is, will Chase ever manage to find Tanner again and explain what uh, his reasons for the rebuff? First off, I really love the quirky secondary characters of this story, especially uh, the, uh, the young Jordan, who's having an especially difficult time managing his uh, wolfy instincts and has quite the knack for getting himself into trouble. And, uh, the, you know, there was a lot of fun banter between the characters, which added an enjoyable lightness to the story. But as for our two main characters, I found them both extremely likable and ended up rooting for them to uh, finally get together. And I thought that the journey that took them to their happily ever after was uh, well done and a lot of fun to boot. So this was actually a story with engaging characters and a well-crafted plot, along with several surprises peppered throughout the uh, story. It wasn't only cleverly written, but also was laugh out loud funny in places. <laughs> And I found it to be a breath of fresh air in the paranormal genre. So if you like witty banter, shenanigans, and a heartfelt romance, and don't mind a shifter story, then Howling on Hold is definitely worth checking out. So the next book that I read was also an arc from NetGalley, and it was entitled Echoes on Hold by Katie McGarry. So because of the blurb, I went into this story thinking that it was going to be a YA paranormal novel, given that it follows our main character, Victoria, who has the ability to see ghosts, especially the spirit of her recently deceased mom. But, you know, I would classify Echoes Between Us more as a hard-hitting contemporary romance, as the paranormal aspect of the story is really secondary to the other themes. Now, a good portion of Veronica's life is consumed by a well-kept secret. She has a brain tumor, the same kind that killed her mom, whose symptoms include crippling migraines. So she suffers with these practically daily, and she lives her life with the knowledge that her time on the planet is quickly running out. But when Veronica ends up working on a school project with Sawyer, the uh, super popular golden boy slash swim team jock at her school, her life changes in ways she could never have imagined, and she discovers that there's a lot more to Sawyer than first meets the eye. So he's quite a troubled boy, and because of his dyslexia, he struggles with maintaining his grades, and uh, his family life is also unraveling quickly. Moreover, he has resorted to a coping mechanism that could prove deadly for him. So it's also worth mentioning that the project that Veronica and Sawyer are working on is to prove the existence of ghosts through a hands-on experience and research. So when this unlikely pair comes together, they both end up questioning their stereotypes and both end up learning and growing in the process. They each also have to make some extremely difficult decisions about their present life and their future. And of course, they end up falling in love. So what I enjoyed about this book is how it alternated between the point of view of Veronica and Sawyer so that we get to see what's going on in each of their heads and where each of them was coming from. Additionally, most of Sawyer's chapters include snippets from a diary written in the early 1900s by a girl named Evelyn who, uh, who had tuberculosis and was hospitalized at a, at a sanatorium. And the quotes that are put into the story are actually from a real life diary, which added an extra special aspect to the story. I also enjoyed the uh, enemies to lovers element of the story, which is one of my favorite tropes, and which I thought was exceptionally well done here, and felt that Sawyer and Veronica fit together perfectly uh, with each of them complementing the other. 
The characters, especially our two main ones, were so well written and so realistic that they practically jumped off the page for me and I really couldn't help but become immediately attached to the both of them. Uh, I really loved Veronica. She's strong, brave, resilient, and feisty. And I loved how she lived life on her own terms and to hell what anyone else thought of her. Sawyer is also an admirable character in the story who is also strong, complex, resilient, and confused, and someone who has to make some really, really tough choices regarding his family. Actually, both of them have to deal with some pretty intense and serious emotional issues. So, yeah, Echoes Between Us ended up being a hard-hitting but empowering story. Oh, also, addiction is a huge theme in this story, where Sawyer is addicted to dangerous adrenaline rushes and his mother is an alcoholic. And what I liked about this book is, that how, is how it approached the uh, idea of addiction from a non-judgmental and positive manner. The novel also dealt with several other sensitive topics, such as death, enablers, grief, terminal illness, mental, mental illness, depression, alcoholism, the pressure to be always perfect, uh, bullying, <laughs> dysfunctional families, acceptance, and love. So, as you can see, it definitely was a hard-hitting story. And so, what I thought was going to be a fluffy ghost story really ended up being a, quite an intense emotional journey. It's a multi-layered story with several different storylines and moving parts, all of which blended together beautifully. And the ghost hunting aspect of the story was a lot of fun and has a compelling uh, additional element to the narrative. So, this book... It really wrecked me in the best and most unexpected ways. It's a sucker punch of a story that blew me away. It's emotional, sobering, and profound, and I enjoyed every single moment of it. You know, from start to finish, this endearing story held me in rapt attention, and I will definitely read more by this author. So the next book that I read in January was entitled Infinity Sun by Adam Silvera. So this was a highly anticipated novel for me as I'm a huge fan of Adam Silvera's work. I loved They Both Die at the End and History's All You Left Me. And I thought that uh, his collaboration with Becky Abertelli, uh, What If It's Us, was also a decent story. So I was super excited when I learned that he was writing a fantasy novel featuring a gay protagonist. In fact, I uh, pre-ordered it several months ago, and when it arrived earlier this month, I couldn't wait to delve in, so I started it right off. So this is kind of a superhero urban fantasy that follows two twins, Eli and Brighton, who, especially Brighton, always dreamed about having superpowers. And they grew up idolizing a group of vigilante superheroes who are uh, called Celestials, who refer to themselves as Spellwalkers. And their goal is to rid the world of the evil Spectres, which is another group of superpowers. Though they weren't born with them, they actually created them for themselves by stealing the blood and life essence of uh, endangered magical creatures. So there's a war going on between these spellwalkers and the specters. And then the brothers are attacked one night and Emil manifests his own power, which thrusts him right in the center of the two factions. So additionally, Brighton is uh, overly resentful of his brother, believing that he should have been the one to have the powers, because he, he's the one who always really, really wanted them. So thus, loyalty and brotherhood are put to the test in this story. How to proceed? I'm just going to say, I'm going to be of the unpopular opinion here. And I hate to say it, but this story just really did not work for me. I think it could have used some additional world building and character development. Because we were introduced to so many characters and tons of new terms without really knowing how they fit in the story. So we had to try to, try to piece together uh, from what was happening, uh, the backstory of what's going on. I'm still not quite sure if I understand the difference between a celestial and a spellwalker, or if there is even a difference. There are, there are also people called bloodcasters, which I think 
with another name for the Spectres? I'm not really sure. So as I struggled through the story, trying to figure out this new world that we're introduced to, you know, I found that I never really connected to the characters. And I think that's probably the main thing. So yeah, by the end of the book, you know, I really didn't care what happened to our characters. So maybe that additional character development could have helped. Or maybe there were just so many characters to keep track of that the connection between our main characters or main protagonists and the readers just didn't happen. But I did notice that when reading the different point of views, it was often difficult for me to distinguish the different character voices. So, you know, I was about 130 pages in and I thought that if this would have been a library book and not a book that I purchased, I probably would have DNF'd it. I was just not connecting with the story, but I soldiered on and the story did pick up for me and I did get into it a little bit more. But any goodwill that the author created during the last half of the story for me was utterly destroyed by the cliffhanger at the end. And this wasn't just a cliffhanger, mind you, but the worst type of cliffhanger in which the story abruptly ended mid-scene. So now, so those of you who follow me know my opinion on cliffhangers. So needless to say, I was super pissed off by the lame ending. I felt robbed again. I expected an entire book and I got only part of one. So needless to say, I will not be continuing on with this series. And I ended up giving this book two stars. So yeah, not a fan. All right, so the last book that I read in the first half of January, and the book that I've already talked about on this channel, is entitled Sundown Motel by Simone St. James. So this is a ghost story, thriller, mystery, and crime novel all rolled into one that revolves around a somewhat sleazy, poorly maintained hotel in Fell, New York, named the Sundown Motel. Now I talk about this quite in depth in my Thriller Thursday video, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the plot and what I thought about it, but I will put a card to the video above so uh, you can check it out on your own if you like. And check out the video that I, that I posted. So I'll just say that this follows two women, Viv Delaney, who worked at a night clerk at the hotel and disappeared in the middle of her shift and was never heard from again, and her niece Carly, who 35 years later goes to Fell, New York in an attempt to discover what happened to her aunt so many years ago. So she ends up taking the exact same shift at the exact same hotel as her aunt did decades earlier. But there's something going on with the Sundown Motel. It's extremely haunted, complete with doors to locked rooms opening and closing on their own accord, uh, lights flickering on and off, the smell of a perfume and cigarette smoke where there's nobody around, uh, disembodied voices, oh, yeah. and several ghostly manifestations of, of people who had died at the motel. So it doesn't take long before Carly begins experiencing the same hair-raising events that her aunt did and ends up falling down pretty much the same rabbit hole. So the narrative here is told from two alternating timelines and points of view. Viv in 1982 and her niece Carly in 2017 as they each solve the same mystery but in two different time periods. Now I thought the author did an excellent job of connecting and intertwining the narratives of these two women and illustrated nicely the parallels of each of their stories as we uncovered the mystery from the two different timelines and then how it converged in the present. So I thought this plot device was especially unique and expertly executed. And uh, as many of you know, I love me a good ghost story. And the Sundown Motel was a phenomenal one. This book had a creep factor that is off the charts. So note that the official launch of this book is February 18th. I actually got an early release of this from the, uh, the Book of the Month Club, but the book is available for pre-order if you want. And I'll have a link uh, for all the books down below. So that concludes my January wrap-up part one. As always, I thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all your support. And if you liked this video, I'd really appreciate it if you click the like button below as that really helps my channel out. So I will talk to you all in the next video. Roger now. Ooh.